and take the group out and uh, kind of some exciting stuff looking forward. So we also get, this is a, the crew that we were able to get around our hemp field, so it's fun because you get to play with new crops and there, there seems to be more and more opportunities with this crop. But uh, the one fellow that isn't here, I get him driving in here. He, uh, he's our scientist from Pakistan, and he, he fell in love with, uh, actually this is Mike's motorbike. He said, oh, this is all we drive in Pakistan. So he hopped on there and now he, he actually lives in Edmonton. But the fact that, you know, as an applied research group, we have full-time scientists on, on board, and we're, we're really thinking that getting more into the uh, real science of applied research is going to be the next step for us as an organization. So I want to start out, you know, everybody likes talking about the weather and the whole that we're going to be doing today. We've got two learners coming is who is the hottest and driest in southern Alberta? And everybody thinks they were. I actually have some data because what we do is about data. Uh, and I'm going to give away prizes now. Who, who, who claims to be the hottest and driest in southern Alberta? Somebody has to take a guess or I'm just going to stand here. You get a prize. Would you like a hat, a coffee mug, or a pair of gloves? I'll do that. All right. Oh, I want to hit the list on something. It was not the hottest and driest, but I'll tell you why in a minute why you get a prize. He's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll take another guess. What are for? Many berries. One for? Forty way. Forty way. You're blocked. <laughs> So, so is somebody saying medicine hat? Right. So what do you want? Hat? Mug? One of each. More rain? That's all you want? Rain. That's all that matters. Are you going to ask me or do I have to throw a coffee mug across the chair? Sure. Coffee mug? Sure. Hat? I feel like a Waldo. day that I decided to take my kids hiking and ride on <laughs> They had little red faces. <laughs> they still loved it though. Okay, we'll get one more guess out. Sure. No. <laughs> Spruce Grove. Southern Alberta, so you definitely lose. <laughs> Lethbridge, somebody gets a, a prize for Lethbridge. What do you want, hat, gloves, or a mug? Mug. Alright. Nobody would have guessed left, which I'm surprised. Well, it's always windy, it's windy. <laughs> so here, here's the actual results, and this is actually the, the data from the Alberta government network of weather stations called ACES. And what we did was came up with a little mathematical formula to combine both moisture and heat to be the hottest and driest combination. So Bow Island actually had the least amount of rain of all of southern Alberta, so that's why you got a prize. But it only ranked number four for hottest and driest. Lethbridge was actually the driest compared to normal, so 59%. We were quite low on, on moisture. Medicine Hat won a prize because they were the hottest, 2,745 heat units. So we're, we're almost like Southern Ontario here. <laughs> and the actual winner for hottest and driest was Del Bonita, but uh, you know, nobody really lives there, so I didn't expect him <laughs> to guess the answer. But um, that was the ranking. So Del Bonita, Warner, Lethbridge, Boyle, Brooks, Medicine Hat, certainly the drop, hottest and driest areas. The difference probably is, is the soil. You know, we had we have much better soil in Lethbridge than the medicine had as far as you know clay content, organic matter, moisture content, able to push us through. So sandier soils out this way certainly had a, a much more significant effect on crop growth. But so have some data behind it, but certainly you guys can continue to your debates and uh, tell each other that you're the hottest and driest. So I'm gonna talk about a, a study that we've been playing around out here. Scott Lair's place, actually. And it's the idea of 
grazing winter cereals. So really, we got uh, turned on to this by Doxal Limited, who was working with with Scott, and kind of a kind of a neat concept in that after a silage crop, he plants his winter cereals, and then lets it grow until freeze up. Now, you probably put your cows out right away. No? Yeah, pretty close. So sometime end of October, November, he'll throw them up into the fall growth of the winter cereals, graze that until springtime, pull them out, fertilize it, and let it grow as a second crop. So this is a practice that's pretty common in other parts of the world, especially down in the southern states and Texas and such. We've always had issues with winter hardiness in some of our winter cereals, and even up in Medicine Hat, winter wheat's kind of been slow in adoption a lot because of winter hardiness. So even though Medicine Hat's the hottest place in the province, it actually has much harsher wind uh, winters than, say, Lac Rouge does. So in the study, we looked at the three, the three winter cereals that there are available, fall rye, winter triticale, and winter wheat. And we did a combination right off the Scots field. And we did a small plot study. This is, uh, this is Mike's slide, by the way. He's not here today. I didn't put these ugly cows on here. But we grazed part of it, and then the other part we actually caged, caged off, so that we'd be able to compare the impact of grazing. Also take some measurements and try to get a, a feel for what are the management practices that are going to sort of optimize winter survival, and also optimize yield in the end. So our 25, again, these are also preliminary data that we don't have all of our site years, so everything sort of takes with a grain of salt, but we're going to present some of our preliminary results. When we look at winter survival, this is simply basically counting the plants before and after the winter and seeing what survives. Our grazing, you can see that it's grazed quite well. These pictures were taken in the spring. We had about a 60% survival of, of the, the crops overall. And then actually when we didn't graze it, we had just about 100%. So good survival this year. We had a very mild winter this year. There are years where uh, the conditions will really change and survival becomes more of an issue. This year it wasn't. The interesting news here is when we look at the harvest, and, and for us, the harvest is in October when it's being grazed, and then again as a silage crop. So we did actually have a study in 2013 that we didn't get to harvest, but we did have the fall grazing. We were able to get 2.24 tons per hectare in that fall growth overall. This past season, 2014, 1.73 tons. So that's that's kind of like free crop, basically. Uh, it, it wouldn't really go to anything except um, it, unless you were grazing it. Then when we came in and took the silage of it, we had another 7.4 tons per hectare for a combined harvest of 9.17 tons. So this is that idea of grazing and then also letting it grow as another crop. Conversely, when you don't graze it, the silage that we achieved was 7.78 tons. So now we're looking at really the opportunity of almost a 20% increase in yield by doing that fall grazing, which is probably what Scott likes to do. On the other side of it, we actually saw really no significant uh, impact of the grazing on the yield. And that's a positive. So even though we had a 60% survival, we still had a, a, a good enough plant stand to, so that it wouldn't impact negatively impact the yield. So we have no no relationship. Basically, the the stats here says that there's no difference between these these two uh, yields. We did see some slight differences in the cultivars that we use. So we used uh, we tried to pick one variety of both a grazing and a grain variety. So the other neat thing is is if you say grazed a winter wheat you could still actually take that as a grain crop instead of a silage crop. So if you've got that opportunity, you can. So we had a couple of fall rise in red, so that was hazelnut and prima. And the blend <coughs> was actually a triticale and ptarmigan, which ended up having the best yield. The, the letters mean there's really no statistical significance except for these two down here, which are our winter wheats. So winter wheats are the lowest yield group. On the grain yield side of things, we saw pretty much the same results as we would for the silage biomass. Uh, hazelnut was the most, and ptarmigan down here was the least. But again, not tremendously huge differences between the, the cultivars on the grain yield side of things. 
We also are testing a seed treatment. So that's that insecticide seed treatment. You may have heard there's anecdotal evidence that it will improve uh, bigger or perhaps fall growth. Uh, in 2015, we saw no effect of the seed treatment. However, we saw a small treatment effect on the amount of biomass that grew in 2013, but not at, a, not at your typical um, confidence level. So we would be 90% confident that there was a treatment effect in, in 2013. This is the, a, a second trial that we also felt was pretty important to study. So not only were we were looking at the different types of winter cereals, in this case we wanted to zero in on winter wheat. And the reason is winter wheat is the least winter hardy. So that's one that uh, if we can increase our management practices that will set it up for success, we're going to see it on winter wheat before we see it on fall on triticale. And in this case, we thought that the seeding date is really going to be important. Um, our, our three dates that we did were August 20th, September 15th, and October 3rd. And that would have been both the exact same trial we would have grazed, and then we would, we would have caged it off. I don't think ungrazed is really a proper word. It's not grazed, but we'll go with it. As we move, the blue bars are the biomass that the cows would have been able to harvest in the fall or during the winter. So you can see as we drop down, not surprisingly, uh, with dates from August 20th to September 15th, you've lost the fall growing season and the biomass is reduced accordingly. And when you get to October 3rd, you almost have nothing to, to feed. And in this case, our September 15th seeding date certainly out yielded the other two. And I think maybe under different years, we might actually see this bar would continue straight like this. This is the exact same thing. We had a slight impact by the grazing on all three of them in this case. On the winter wheat, again, more susceptible to the damage probably caused by cattle grazing on it and damage to the crown and plant stand and all that. But this year, I think we also saw that we, we saw damage to the earliest seeding crops because of the spring frosts. And I'm not sure, I think we talked to Jamie about that too. Even fall rye has grown so far advanced uh, early in the spring that it loses its frost tolerance. And sometimes the crop's heading and we get a frost. So that's a bit of a risk, but at the same time, you can see the potential for uh, optimizing seeding dates for both uh, grazing in the fall and the silage crop. On the grain yield, it showed up uh, significantly that the September 15th on winter wheat was, was very high. I have to double check our numbers, but at, at this level, we're actually hitting 120 bushels per acre of winter wheat in this irrigated scenario. So pretty pretty good yields. And again, sort of shows that there is sort of an optimum time. You can be too early and you can be too late. Are there any questions on that grazing study? Because I'm going to move on to a different study. Yes, Ken. one comment with this the winter kill stuff. Um, my cows are out there until about the 10th to 12th of April. Mm -hmm. And I from what I've seen, my opinion, but I think most of the damage that I'm seeing, seeing there, is actually done in the spring. Yeah. Most cows are taken off before spring thaw. Um, it would make quite a difference. Unfortunately, I can't do that. They go straight from these fields up to the cabin pastures. But it seems to me the worst springs are one where it starts to grow and you get a real hard frost that kills off the winter wheat, winter crop. It starts to come back. The cows keep grazing. It does that two or three times. Those seem to be the years that we have the worst winter kill. It does, that makes a lot of sense to me. We, we would have witnessed that when we were studying yeah. things like winter peas that don't have good winter hardiness as well. The years where it warms up and the cows start grazing in and it doesn't really freeze off and the plant can get going and get ahead, it doesn't seem to be as bad. So. Cool. But I just don't have the option. So, right. so you make up for it with a higher seeding rate maybe or something? Like yeah, that. I see. Yeah. There's another question, I think? Yes. Um, at what kind of growth stage of the plant do you put them in? Like, is it just when they can't pull it out anymore, or how big is it? Uh, well, it's, we, the cows haven't come home yet. We've seeded August early through the month of August, different times. Right now, that stuff is knee high. But it's just when 
I would personally, I would wait. It's going to be heavily grazed until at least four or five leaf stakes, you know, four leaves. Good, good, good stand there and good roots before I started grazing them very heavily. But we just we don't bring our cattle home until they have to come off pasture. So, so basically, it's when it stops growing. There is an ability to find those stages. We do graze our dry land crops, seeded around the 15th, 20th of September, and the cows are out there when I'm seeding. But they also have native grass, and they're, they are grazing it lightly right away when they don't have a problem. So it's not intensively grazed. I should mention that we, we also tested the, the fall graze for feed value, and it's somebody described it to me as cocaine for cows. And <laughs> really, really high energy, kind of low on fiber, and they suggest supplementing fiber, but of course when you have access to the, the good stuff, why would you eat the straw? But really good feed value. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a new project that has been pretty exciting. You can't see my mouse. There you go. I'm just going to start off with a little video for that. Hello, I'm Ken Coles, General Manager of Farming Smarter. Now, one of the worst things that can happen to a farmer is, uh, is a great big hailstorm, the Great White Combine. And it's one of those things that we don't really have a lot of knowledge or science about what to do with your crop after a hail. And that's one of the projects that we are initiating. Our first project funded by the Pulse Commission was to develop a hail simulator. And fortunately, we were lucky and able to manufacture a simple and effective tool that would simulate the hail damage. Now we didn't simulate hail, but the damage that it made. So this is something that we can use in our research to get a better handle on some of the management practices and tough decisions that farmers have to make after a hailstorm. So with our hail simulator this year, the main objective was to actually develop the simulator and test it for its effectiveness. Luckily, uh, we had some help from AFSC and they were able to confirm that the damage we were creating was indicative of what you'd see in a natural hailstorm. But what we wanted to do was control it and have it even. One of the nicest things about being able to control that is that now we have the ability to have a check strip with an unhailed damage crop. So that if we're testing rescue products such as uh, a fungicide or micronutrient and, and such, we have the ability of testing that versus an unhailed crop. We want to make sure that, that the response we're seeing isn't just because of the product, but uh, because of the hail damaged tissues. So we damaged a number of crops and we use them as part of our diagnostic field school this year. We, we damaged wheat at various levels, both by hand using a dog chain method and with our simulator, which is basically a, a bunch of chains uh, being rotated on a drum. We damaged peas at various levels back in July. We did dry beans and faba beans as well. So that we're basically preparing for our trial next year. In addition to that, we, we managed to get a, a plot looking at canola as well. So we damaged 25%, 50%, 75%, and 100% damage on one week intervals once the crop was in the rosette stage right until middle of flowering. We'll be looking at harvesting those plots and, and studying the quality effects as well that are important to know at the end of the season. So given that Alberta is the hail capital of North America, once we've started thinking about this uh, use of the simulator and the different studies that we can put into place, we feel that there's a lot of strong demand for more work in various crops. To date, we have a fun, uh, project funded in pulses, but we'd certainly love to look at uh, other crops such as canola and the different cereals as well and even just to get a better handle on on some of the decisions making those those are some tough decisions when when to invest or when not to invest and what to do with hail damaged crops so we're looking forward to developing some answers to some of those really tough questions so kind of a fun project we get to go beat up crops uh, the really neat thing was is how well we got to test the simulator out. 
and find out that it works. And I actually got hail on my little farm this year for the first time ever and realized that it's that it really is a difficult situation to be in. I mean, there's not a lot of support on the decision-making side of things. This was a, a study that we did manage to get on canola that you noticed. And what was really cool was, and I think a lot of people know that, was the recovery potential of, say, canola on an early season hail damage. And, and that's what these green bars here, that would have been our damage done just before bolting. Um, this is where we've only seen really about 10% yield reduction at, at that 25% damage. Until, and even, you know, this was supposedly our 100% rating here and we still got you know, at least 50% of our yield. So I think that's probably, it's that earlier time frame where we're probably going to have the opportunity to perhaps learn a little bit more on making decisions. And even as we move, you know, this, this is only one week difference when we get to here on these orange bars at seven days after bolting, where you can see that the damage or the ability for the plant to recover is, is definitely reduced significantly. And then as we move forward, we were finding that uh, we actually had the adjusters out and we were, their, their ratings were agreeing with, with our intended levels of damage quite nicely. And except for the early stages, later on they were, they were quite close. The neat thing uh, to add on to this project that we're trying to do is once we do start doing the study, we're going to be looking at rescue products like fungicides and we've all heard sort of big stories out there with the potential to, you know, in, improve the chance of recovery, but now we'd actually like to put some numbers to it. A side note is, is that we're going to work with Dr. Ann Smith, who is a remote sensing expert with Ag Canada as well, and we're going to probably get a drone out there. And this might be an actual application for drones that's, you know, more meaningful than just some pretty pictures. We're thinking that it, we should be able to calibrate the imagery to be able to go out and actually rate a farmer's field. So if we use our small plots to understand the algorithm and the difference in defoliation and, and its impact on reflectance, that what we could do is, as soon as the farmer's field is hailed, and maybe even the FSC guys would, would like that, is, is that you could take the, take the drone out there, get some immediate imagery of it, so then you'd be able to predict the level of damage as well as the spatial distribution. So say half of your field is 80% damage, you want to green feed that and you might salvage the other half. It might actually be able to add some more timely pieces of information to make those decisions a little bit easier. I'm going to keep going because I'm running out of time. The last project that I'm going to talk about is a new one as well. We only have a little bit of data on this and it's the idea of dry land grain corn production. The, uh, the seed companies have really big projections for the ability to expand corn into Western Canada. So we uh, thought that we better get on board and trying to come up with some of the agronomy decisions that are going to help tailor it. And at Lethbridge, you saw that Lethbridge was actually one of the driest. We, we had some pretty nice crops without any irrigation. I, I was pretty impressed with how the crop did. This study that we're looking at is actually looking at the row spacing and planting population interactions. So when I talked to Dwayne back down in South Dakota, his prediction was a 20 inch row spacing with 20,000 kernels would be optimum for sort of a dry land zero tillage type scenario. These, you can see these front rows are the 20 inch spacing and then the back is 30. So a pretty different distribution as far as the plants have been field. Well, this is our, our innovative videographer in the back here, we, we're always trying to do things with, with cameras, so this is actually oh, totally Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to share that with you because I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> and this is uh, Mike, he's hilarious too. But, um, you know, dryland corn did really surprisingly well with our first data of this year. So the, the low heat unit uh, varieties made grain corn even at a dry state in Lethbridge, we, we harvest uh, the middle of October. We've just recently purchased a new row crop planter, so we've got a monosem planter set up with um, side banding, so that's another thing. 
you know, moving to a roll crop and where do you put the band, the fertilizer, do you do liquid, do you do granular, we're probably going to try to figure all that out. We have probably the ugliest color combination on the combine you've ever seen. So this is our, our corn header on our winter standard flock combine. Nice. Yeah, that, that's a nice color. Works, works well though. And here's the results from that, that study. Remember I said Dwayne Beck predicted the 20 inch row spacing, which is sort of unconventional. Trying to find here. So the blue line is our 20 inch row spacing. This is basically a response curve. This is yield bushels per acre across our planting population. Uh, 15,000 kernels all the way up to 35,000 kernels. Uh, once we get past the 20,000 kernels per acre, you can see that the 20 inch line basically is out yielding the 30 inch row spacing. And that's kind of an interesting dynamic because we're looking at uh, crop competition and intercrop hunt, crop hunt competition. I'm a little concerned that maybe we didn't go high enough because normally uh, we're thinking that we should be down here. <coughs> Whereas on our 30 inch row spacing, we did sort of plateau and start coming back down. So, again, that's not only that's only one trial. We have plans next year to have sites in Lethbridge, Royal Island, Medicine Hat, Brooks, and, and possibly up in Carsland as well. So it'll be fun to, to dig into that. We're also going to be looking at crop sequences. How do we fit grain corn into rotation? So what's the best crop to follow it with? So this year we're going to plant with a new number of crops so that we can plant corn into next year. And we'll be looking at the fertility management as well. Two minutes, I'm done. Do you have any questions on corn? Not that I know a lot about it, but we're learning. 80 bushels per acre on dry land corn. Does that make sense to you guys? Like two acres or anything. The nice thing, you know, you know how we got fall rains this year? Everybody was complaining that we had more rain during harvest than we did during the growing season. And that's a legitimate complaint. Corn might be one of those crops that can take advantage of this fall rains too. So 80 bushels an acre on dry land corn. There's a premium for corn. Uh, to the feedlot industry, so I've heard they're actually paying a dollar a bushel more than the price you see on on that. So right now we'd be at about five fifty bushel on corn. Based on what moisture? That's a good question. That'd be probably based on dry moisture. Yeah. Late yeah. side yeah. last week checked out they were three seventy eight for thirty thirty percent. Yeah, and when you're pricing corn, they they tend to. Oh, somebody told me it's five cents per percent of moisture per bushel that they charge. So um, if you're bringing in high moisture corn, they're docking. But if you came in with dry corn, that's a different story. Right. Push your nutrients down on that account. This one, we just made sure that nutrient was not a limiting factor. Next year, we will start looking at fertility ranges to, to determine that response curve. But from what I understand, <coughs> Saints, it'd be the same fertility regimen as, as wheat and canola per bushel. There's sort of this reputation that corn uses more nitrogen, but the only reason it does is because it gives you yields higher. Alright, we'll move on. Thank you so much. Next time.